Welcome to The Real Recovery Show. We air every Friday at noon, and we're excited about all the feedback we've been getting. It's been surprising. I went to speak to a room full of teenagers, and as I'm talking, one of the kids said, wait, wait, you do The Real Recovery Show? My mom watches that show. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. So it's been interesting. We've been having a variety of topics, and um, today is a really cool topic. Um, Today's topic really speaks to, um, there's this, this double standard around people who have been either in the military or they're currently in the military or are first responders like uh, police officers or EMT um, or firefighters or people who work in emergency rooms, uh, surgeons, um, et cetera, that they have to, of course, be in all the ways that they can be capable of handling a very intense, high stressful situation um, and are expected to operate at that level. Um, but yet, because of either um, former PTSD or things that happen um, where they don't necessarily learn the, the proper tools to be able to handle a situation or things they've seen that they haven't processed, um, exhaustion, uh, whatever, um, that they may not be able to. And yet there's this, there's, this, there's this fear, and we've talked about this on a previous episode on uh, brain spotting, about is this, there's, this, there's this fear of being able to really step up and say, hey, I need help, because nobody wants to look like they can't do their job and that they can't be relied on. It's a really big deal. And so this is a very stressful environment um, a lot of times, um, people who go out into the military, and we had a whole episode on veterans and recovery, um, have PTSD before they even go to the military. And sometimes they just end up um, experiencing something in the military where they have PTSD. Um, but oftentimes, um, nobody even realizes that they had PTSD before they went to the military until they're in a situation where they get diagnosed with PTSD because of something maybe that happened later. But through recovery, through healing, through uh, therapy, they find out that they had it before. Um, well, anyway, so there are lots of 12-step programs, and there are lots of rehabs, um, but there's actually a whole subset specifically uh, focused for people healing from addiction who are also in these kinds of occupations. Um, and we have the, at the... Um, at the meeting space have a Veterans in Recovery Alcoholics Anonymous meeting every Saturday. Um, but there's actually a 12-step program that even more so encompasses uh, not just the storyline of what somebody who is either who has been in service or is currently in service in some way, shape, or form um, needing in a 12-step program, but actually um, also helps with this double standard because now it's a safe place for them to go where they don't necessarily have to worry about um, if you're a police officer um, being in the same room with somebody you might have arrested because um, that can happen has happened um, I, I one time heard a story about a, a woman in Alcoholics Anonymous how she was a police officer and uh, she found herself in the room with somebody that she had just recently put in the back of her cop car um, but also um, being able to let go um, and being able to share about what's really going on at a level of uh, people who also understand what's going on, but yet not having to worry about um, needing to be um, unnecessarily strong. You know, this is a place where they can unpack and process, get the support, and really heal for if they've ended up uh, going and having any kind of addiction whatsoever. It's kind of interesting in the years of recovery that I have been in how um, one can think that if you end up addicted to something that it's like this really horrible thing like you must have failed at life and what's ended up happening is that the actual addiction when one bottoms from it becomes a door that opens and gives the person this amazing opportunity to have a completely new experience with their entire their entire programming, their entire experience with their life, everything. And only if you've been in recovery do you really get how amazing that is. Um, whereas other people might think, oh, wow, that person, you know, 
became addicted. So, so today we're going to be speaking to somebody who, um, who has grown up um, with some PTSD, who went to the military, um, and who ended up going through a program, and um, for um, for addiction um, from medication. And uh, this program was specifically for people who are healing from addiction, who also are veterans, et cetera, and it's called the Warrior's Heart Program. And so joining with us today is Joshua, who's been sober since August 12th, 2020, and he's gonna be sharing about his story. And as we go, we're gonna just do a little chit-chatting like we normally do, so welcome to our show. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was um, a great intro, thank you. Uh, I was just sitting over here like reeling through my mind about everything as you were describing it kind of took me back through, mm. <laughs> through a lot of it. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, the Warrior's Heart um, program saved my life, honestly. So so when you were growing up, um, did you have anything? Because I know you ended up in the military. Um, did you have anything in your childhood that happened that kind of made you want to be in the military or made you have more of a susceptibility to PTSD or anything or? Yeah, I think just uh, having my father, you know, that was in the military and kind of all his um, siblings and my grandfather and long line of veterans that I come from, it was just, I didn't even think about college. It was just, I knew I was going mm -hmm. in the military. Um, after 9-11 happened, I almost went in the Marines and my dad talked me out of it. Um, I appreciate him for that because I might not be here, but <laughs> um, then I get the jokes from where I did go in the, the Air Force, like him. I followed in his footsteps, but everyone calls it the Chair Force. Oh. It wasn't what I did. Um, I was kind of more on the front lines, but uh, yeah, my childhood um, definitely uh, have some some PTSD and things that came out of that, and I didn't even realize it until I got you know older and then looked back through my 20s and kind of reflected on everything to where I understood, wow, you know, kind of the pain and everything that I had gone through as a child, um, abandonment of a mother and kind of my chasing women through through my life. Uh, I think it set me up for putting myself in situations that would cause further PTSD. And mm -hmm. so it was just like, it was a domino. Um, mm -hmm. I've read a book recently and then it was talking about the one thing and you have a domino that's half the size of the next domino and you could eventually have a domino that would reach the moon. Ooh, I love that visual. Yep. And mm. that was kind of how it felt um, as things tumbled through my life. Yeah. Uh, it led me into uh, Warrior's Heart, actually. So, yeah, there was... Um, so when you were in the military... Um, what happened that you ended up, like, when did your addiction start? Honestly, I would say my addiction, full-blown addiction, started um, when I was in my early 20s, I think, when I went in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. um, I I had tendencies of it from when I was in my teens. I mean, the first time I ever um, smoked weed was 14, drank 14, and never seemed to have a problem with it. It was like mm -hmm. something that I've reflected on over the years too was that um, it was like having this defect, I guess, as we describe it sometimes, of character allowed me to do things that I knew were wrong and didn't care because I didn't really have like these morals mm. for some reason that weren't packing in the way that it did for other people. Mm. Um, I just kind of... I labeled myself as a rebel and that's the the line that I walked and then being in recovery here and all these other stories I'm, I'm like oh I'm not any different than any one of these people in here they're all the same right. <laughs> so I was like we uh, all feel terminally unique until yeah. we get to a room full of other terminally unique people <laughs> yeah, it's very true I was the black sheep and I hear that in every oh I labeled myself as the black sheep oh. right oh I did too right. how many black sheep are there yeah. <laughs> you get to a room of black sheep yeah. and everybody's black yep. <laughs> Yep. That's so funny. Yeah, I I found so much comfort in that though mm -hmm. for the first time and I think my addiction spiraled obviously much faster is like the domino effect like I was saying it just got bigger and faster as things went on and um 
I had ups and downs and I've kind of understood that about life now too, is everything comes in waves. You have these peaks and valleys mm -hmm. and my addiction was no different. I mean, I went through periods of drinking and then not drinking, but it wasn't because I thought I was an alcoholic. I just stopped drinking. And then whenever I thought about being an alcoholic, I looked back and said, Oh no, I can quit. Mm -hmm. You know, same with the opioids that I got into, but, um, yeah, my childhood and then my teenage years didn't really get into too much trouble, luckily. Um, but when I went in the military, you know, I, I remember getting in trouble for drinking underage in the dorms and they sent me to like these alcohol sensation classes where you had to go learn about alcoholism. And, and I was like, well, <laughs> that doesn't sound like me at all, you know? And then as I got to my first duty station, I remember some of the higher ranking officers are like, oh, we're going to teach you how to drink like a professional, uh. you know, and because I was air crew. So we would fly, travel, um, TDY everywhere. And it was like, first thing you did before you even went to the base was go buy all the beer. What's TDY? Uh, temporary duty assignment, oh. basically. So okay. like if we would go, sometimes when I was um, stationed in Alaska, we would go to um, over to Japan for like 45 days. Okay. Uh, and do different missions over there around. And while we were there, we were staying, you know, in the dormitories. And it was, I just remember we made a beer pyramid of cans <laughs> and seeing how big we could make it before we left. And it was literally from the floor to the ceiling. And it was not just like a cross in one line. It was a pyramid. Mm -hmm. And that was, we were only there for like, I think, 20 days or something. It was ridiculous. But, <laughs> um yeah, it was just, I don't know. And it, it really was. It wasn't an environment where you could just be like, you know, I don't want to drink. It was almost, it was peer pressure in, a, in an adult setting, in a very professional setting. Like, oh, you're in charge of this $20 million aircraft, so you can drink. <laughs> and we're going to teach you that's how to drink it. and hold your liquor <laughs> so you can go fly the next day. Mm -hmm. And that's what it was. I mean... Yeah, yeah, a lot of memories. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, it led me. There is a lot to that, though, <laughs> the collective consciousness that what one person wouldn't do necessarily by themselves, that just because everybody else is into this, everybody's doing it, it's easier to just be like, okay, I'll do this too. It's not really, it doesn't even necessarily mean that like, oh, I'm so, like, we're not necessarily conscious that, you know, this person's not going to like me or I'm not going to be fitting in, although we could be conscious of those ideas. There's just, um, when everybody is focused on doing this behavior, it's it's not as easy for the yeah, but within us that maybe wants to not do it to be strong about that, you know, like. You no, know, it's very true. If I'm with a whole bunch of people that, and I'm only saying this because I just started this whole exercise challenge. But if I'm with a whole bunch of people who are like health conscious and want to exercise and whatever, I'm likely to be a little bit more in that direction. But if I'm the only person and everybody else is sitting around eating and doing whatever, I might end up losing some of that momentum and steam. There's just something about that collective consciousness. No, I, I completely um, agree with that. I mean, it's it's kind of how... Um, when you watch different groups function and, and move through challenges or whatever of life, that's, mm -hmm. it's really is. And that's, what's beautiful about, um, kind of the warriors anonymous stuff. Yeah. All um, recovery. Yeah. That's why they say, get in the middle of the herd. It's yep. like, you can picture yourself. You're in the middle of a herd of people. They're all focused on. You recovery. feel safe. Yeah. And the momentum is moving in a direction yeah. and, and you can't help but move in that direction. Yeah. So yeah. Whatever it was the shows. same thing. Yeah. It's like, I was thinking about that when you were doing the intro to this, you know, they, I, I hear in so many, um, so many times throughout the last few years about how, um, you know, they have this army of conscious collect collectiveness, basically that like, if I have a problem, I, I have so many people I can draw on now and go talk to them. And in the Warriors Anonymous side of it, it's the same way. It's like an, a separate branch. Like you can't talk about some of the things that we talk about outside of the group of Warriors Anonymous yeah. because it would shock 
the right. public in a lot of ways, the stuff right. that we've gone through. And to be able to open up freely in that mm. group, and then now you have this smaller, dialed down, you know, collection of people that have gone through the same thing. It's like they, you know, in 12 Steps AA meetings I go to and I hear some of those things about, you know, I, I don't feel so alone in these meetings because I come here and I hear my story. Yeah. And it's the same in a lot of ways with Warriors Anonymous. Like you go into those meetings and you can hear a lot of the things you've gone through um, and you can relate. It's the same feeling of relation to another human being um, that makes you feel not alone mm-hmm. um, that I love about yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and also because it's a lot of the same people that you would have met in whatever you were doing, whether it was the military, whether it was if they're the police officers with other police officers, like it's the yeah, same type of thinking. Relate to their so now you saw them on the side of addiction maybe, but now you see them now on the side of, of recovery. So you're in the military. Did you get injured? Um, what ended up making, like what happened that made your um, addiction become addiction? Um, so the alcohol addiction was already there. Mm-hmm. Um, I just didn't know it yet. And I got on my second deployment, I was over in Iraq and we were flying out of this little air base in Southern Iraq and we had a bunch of um, severe weather. I remember there was warnings all through the flight plans being filed that day to stay clear of this weather because they had already had multiple aircraft that were um, damaged from, you know, golf ball size hail that they're flying mm-hmm. through. And mm-hmm. so, when uh, before we were taken off too they were telling us hey watch out there's a bunch of ground fire um firefights going off you know the end of the airfield so we're like great so which way are we going and so we had to take off and i believe it was north but as we were flying we were getting shot at um from the ground <clears throat> and i remember we were flying and trying to evade um doing our countermeasures in flight and i was sitting in my <laughs> Um, my little window as a load master in the back of a C-130, you sit there and you call out threats from the back of the plane, whichever side of the window you're on. And we're flying along and doing our evasive maneuvers and um, the navigator was up in his little scope watching all the weather going on around us and trying to keep the pilots away from lightning and everything else. And because of the ground fire, we kept getting pushed further and further towards that storm Mm. and we ended up we were about fourteen thousand feet i remember and i was just getting ready to take off um my flight helmet because i was going to take off my armor uh body armor because at fifteen thousand feet we take it off because most of the threats at that point don't reach that high in altitude Uh, at least they didn't at that time and as i was going to take it off i just remember looking out my window and it went full white and right before that the navigator told the pilot not to like play around off his left wing because there was lightning and the window goes white and it sounded like the plane got hit by a a sledgehammer i just remember this huge thud and then the plane falls i shot to the ceiling um everything in the plane in the back of the plane just seemed like it erupted and when i hit the ceiling my flight helmet got a little crack um across the top i remember from the back i didn't know that till later on but um, I remember looking over at the other load master and he was holding on to the anchor cable, which is where the paratroopers hook up when they're jumping out. And he was holding on to that and his feet were on the ceiling. And the pilots were, I guess, up uh, up in front, pulling back on the yoke and trying to right the plane. And then one pilot, he was like, I don't know how this is going to turn out. And you hear the stress in his voice. Mm-hmm. And um, we pulled out of it as we were coming out i guess the bottom of a cloud so later on we found out we hit a microburst but when i hit the ceiling it was like jumping into an empty pool um so i bulged discs in my neck Mm -hmm. and then as we came out of it i fell down the side of the plane and i guess i bent backwards over the pallet that was in between the two two doors and herniated and ruptured a disc uh in my lower back and i didn't even know it at the time i got up um, after I kind of came to and the other loadmaster was shocked because he thought I'd broke my back the way I was laying and uh, we ended up flying back down to Kuwait and we were supposed to be going to Baghdad but because of what happened we flew down to Kuwait and we all were just kind of in shock still I think and 
my back deteriorated pretty quickly after that. I started having a lot of problems, neck problems, back problems. But did they uh, evaluate you when you got back? They or? did. I, I was, we were grounded for a couple of days and um, I was given Motrin and I was kind of in, I think I was in bed for the first two days when I got back. Um, we didn't have another mission that we had to go fly. And, hmm. and it was just kind of this new pain that I didn't understand what it was. It was just this like pain mm-hmm. sensation down both legs and mm-hmm. the muscle spasms in my lower From back the and nerves and, yeah yep. it mm-hmm. was it was intense but yeah. it was like I could kind of work through it as long as yeah. I move certain ways right and luckily it was I think it was like two weeks before we were going home anyways um, so I just kind of toughed through it and I got back stateside and they sent me to uh, be evaluated and they did x-rays and MRIs and all that stuff and found out that I had these back problems so they put me in this program called back on track I remember because they they had That's these kind of catchy yeah I know <laughs> Air Force's way of like fixing back problems <laughs> you go to this place and they teach you how to stretch mm. like yoga moves and all these things and I was like this is you know I'm mm-hmm. 22 years old I'm mm-hmm. like this is <laughs> what is this shit you know yeah, so yeah, i just yeah. oh sorry very macho too uh, yeah yeah and so I, I would just drink you know yeah. drink the pain away yeah um they didn't put me on any kind of painkillers at that point other than motrin um and i drank like every day we started drinking in the afternoon and um i mean if i wasn't flying a a mission line you drank for the pain or you drank for the pain okay. i think for both there was there was some things that went on um the trauma during that too. deployment too um like all these things kind of started spiraling the, the more i drank the more out of control emotionally i became yeah yeah and i didn't realize it at the time yeah, i just was like oh yeah i was it happened so incrementally it's hard to yeah it seems like it just happens quickly but it's just the emotional state the mentally the mentality of it, it just little by little by little but you don't even realize like you're out of you're out of your mind yeah like the more you try to suppress by yeah. drinking and self-medicating yeah. um yeah. the more things are just kind of like popping yeah. out at the seams because you're literally just, it's like you're in this it's like you're in this capsule and you have like everything that you're stuffing down is like little by little by little drowning you and you keep going no 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 just a little bit more i could still i could still breathe until like you're like okay this is okay i can still make it i'm fine maybe i have a problem yep. yeah maybe i have a problem <laughs> it's like glub glub uh, now i don't have any air and yeah. I, yeah, I'm, I'm finally kind of to that place where i can admit there's something right wrong. yeah but yeah, before Either that, that it's all macho. To be a fish. <laughs> yeah, yep, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and everyone's tolerance goes, you know, That's like. It's amazing, though, that they didn't do like x rays and MRIs. Yeah, over there they didn't. I was walking around, so they just figured I was mm. good. And then I didn't want to stop because you have to have two load masters in combat at all times. Do you think any of it was part of you wanting to be okay? That you. I think so. I mean, truly, when it came to like back pain. <laughs> like I don't, I don't want to have back pain because yeah, yeah. I've seen people yeah. who had had fused surgeries, you know, and then they could hardly twist and bend and all these things. And I'm like, that's not going to be me. Yeah. I'm, I'm in my 20s. I can yeah. still go play basketball. I can still run yeah. and do all these things. And yeah. when I started trying to do those things, yeah, um, yeah, that was when the pain really started to I, kind of I, flare. I completely understand this because I, um, so I had child abuse, and that's where. I had child abuse and then I had a motorcycle accident when I was 17. And, um, but according to the doctors, all my spine injuries happened from the child abuse, right? But like when I was growing up, I just thought I was, you know, growing up weird, you know, like my spine wasn't, it was crooked and whatever like that. But I never went to any official doctor to officially test anything because the same house I got abused in was the same house that wasn't paying attention to that stuff, you know? And I also had this attitude, like I had to be the hero too. Like I had to be the one taking care of my sister, my brother, don't you understand, you know? And um, so I didn't really know. And then um, years later, um, I had so much pain, so many issues. I mean, seizures, et cetera, when your brain gets cut off, your cerebral spinal fluid is not like flowing. Um, it's just whatever. Like I have, uh, I have um, bone spurs in my neck and like oh, yeah. really, really, really thin discs, you know, and, um, Tears in your disc and then and issues with my hip and whatever. And, um, and so I've had amazing amounts of pain in my life, you know, and 
learning to live with it, you know, and learning how to do different things. And I'm still like, I do fascia work, you know, and, and whatever <laughs> like that, because I don't want to have surgery, you know, it's, it's a thing. But, um, but, it, but, but, you know, it's, it's like, it in and of itself can drive a person crazy. When there's just a certain amount, and I, and I've had to do a lot of work on pain, and being in the pain and not letting the pain push me out of my like because when i feel like a lot of pain it's like i want to be anywhere but here yep you know which is the same thing my inner addict says you yep. know i want to be anywhere <laughs> yeah. but here so like can we check out we have a reason now like you're in pain can we check out now and just being in the pain of it like just being in it whatever and and learning to go through all of that so pain in and of itself gets to a point where it's just it could be intolerable if we don't even have the proper tools of it and if we're denying it just like we're denying our feelings you know and then we're acting as if we're okay I and know. maybe doing things that we wouldn't have done had we been more privy to what was really going on you know so i i mean i remember when i was in my early 20s i was already crying out for that desire for tools something to help me right. through the pain and yeah. there was um, a muscle catalog i remember reading when I was working out over in Iraq one time and it was like, don't let the pain overcome you, overcome the pain. And I'm sitting here like, and I would constantly tell myself that when I was over there because, like, I mean, we up, couldn't drink, <laughs> right? I mean, and that was one of the perks of being air crew at the time was, um, hey, we could fly outside of Iraq and go to duty-free stations and then, oh, we're flying back into Iraq. Oh, no. <laughs> right. But, um, yeah, it was, I was already crying out for that, that desire for help, you know, and I, I didn't know it, um, but I didn't want to be with that pain. Um, yeah. And you're right. I mean, I think that even just the thinking of somebody who's more prone to addiction is someone who does not like uncomfortable. Oh, I would like, run from it. Yeah. Fight or flight. I yeah, was like, I, absolutely. I'm, I'm running. Yeah. I didn't want to deal with anything that hurt. Like I remember playing yeah. football in high school. Like like I wrestled to get ready for soccer and right. all this stuff. But when I the first time I really got hit in junior high playing football, I was like, mm, eh, I don't really want to do that. Like I yeah. just and I had those tendencies already um, building. Right. And I think it was from my childhood, my my first six years of my life, um, I have no memory of except for bits and pieces of when I was with my grandma. Because of the physical and emotional abuse, um, I found out later yeah, you on. You check out. Oh, completely. Like goodbye. Oh, yeah, like my if my mom my mom locks me in my room for hours on end, right? So, what would cause me not to check out later on when somebody put me in a bad situation? I'm already my brain's like, no, I'm not going to start recording this because I don't want to remember it. Right, right, right. Um, but it's still there. That's so funny. I do the same thing. Yeah. I go, oh my god, like I won't even remember it. But um, yeah, so. I mean, not to get all the way off into this other topic, but um, but it's interesting because this is just occurring to me now, like how much it's the same issue is there's just this anywhere but here, anytime but now, like I don't want to be in my body, yep. it's obviously not good, I'm feeling feelings I don't want to feel, I'm thinking things I don't want to think, and now I have this pain. Like it's all the same issue, right? Um, so I'll say this last thing on the subject. Um, so I've been doing this fascia work and in the fascia work, because he has to like dig into things that are like, we're talking, I'm 51 years old. So there's 51 years of whatever. I mean, not that it all happened when I was an infant. Okay, that's an exaggeration. <laughs> but like the pain, right? So I will lay there and he will like really get into like some of the stuff that's been locked up for a long time. And um, it'll be, like pain that goes all the way up my neck and across my skull, right? Oh, I felt that before. And oh yes, so much fun, <laughs> all the fun. Mm -hmm. If you're missing it, you gotta know. <laughs> um, but um, so I've I've learned that when I have pain, that like if I if I if I stress about it, if I complain about it in my head, if I go oh no 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 I can't, and if I listen to the fear story it's telling me like you're gonna die, this is not okay, there's something wrong, it's an like, alarm that goes off, then I I will it will be intolerable. But if I if I'm there and I'm like meditating while he's doing it, and I'm like I know that I'm supposed to be here, I trust that he, what he's doing, and intuitively I feel that this is okay. And so it's not, don't worry, it's not the freak out that you're making it body. Um, but um, at the same time, this is just a sensation. 
I could be here with this. And, um, and I even started to do this crazy thing that I intuitively came to me to do. I started telling myself I liked it. Now, I could be a little bit of a masochist, but like for the level of pain that I'm experiencing, I've never been into ever, ever, ever. But now I'm telling myself, just like somebody who's out in the winter cold, telling themselves there's a fire going and they start to feel fire, they start to feel warmth, right? Yep. I start telling myself I like the pain and man, I'm catching myself liking the pain. There's a, there's a change that's happening in the mind. So if I had the ability, because the mind is so powerful this whole time, right? Yep. But I have this addict mentality that says I have to be anywhere but here, anytime but now, then I just didn't have the right program i didn't have the right perspective and it's like it's only in recovery and and keeping on changing this whole thing that we learn to do things differently but before we do we take we take drink alcohol smoke smoke pot we take pain pills which are highly addictive and um especially if one has a predisposition to wanting to be numbed out and so oh numbed out numbed out oh yeah that, that was, was my favorite. That was completely um, and utterly the reason why I kept taking them. Because it got to the point where it just numbed everything. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can't control what pain pills numb eventually. And then it will eventually just numb everything. There are studies that, um, that if you take pain pills for pain, like indicated, it will first go to what's like lit up which is the the receptors and it'll first go to that so the pain will actually go to the pain which is amazing but when you start to take it past the point where you may not need it as much it starts to go to other and blocking other and then you start to actually you start to get a hit you start to get like a click on it right if you're somebody who likes to not feel that's that's how it happens. That's how so many people have gone to like programs for just alcohol and swore they never had a problem with pills, never tried them, never thought anything, maybe took a pain pill here and there in their life, never had an issue, right? Then they go and they have this big surgery coming up, right? And there are people who will be like cringing, you know, because, okay, be careful. Tell them that, tell the doctor that you have addiction, but I don't have addiction to pain medicine. Sure, <laughs> but not saying you will, but saying you could. Just err on the side of caution. caution. Go to the doctor, tell the doctor, I have a problem with addiction. So can we be careful how we do this and have somebody get your pills for you just to make sure, just in case. If, if you're not going to become an addict from it, if you're not, then, hey, you didn't lose anything. So that's like the... But if you do, but oh my God. That's like on the side, um, when I went to rehab, that was, I erred on the side of caution with alcohol <laughs> because I wasn't addicted to alcohol. Right. Like I was opioids. Right. Um, That's funny. So I just kind of got to the point where I was like, nope, I'm going to sign off of alcohol completely because I understood that it's not worth even testing it to right. find out if right. I am. I mean, because, right. yeah. So I agree with that. Err on the side of caution. I had knee surgery last May and, mm-hmm. uh, Told the doc, I was like, you know, I don't, I don't want any pain pills of any kind coming yeah. out of this. He's like, well, all I prescribe is Tylenol threes, and I'm like, no, 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 I don't even want that. And yeah. then when I came out of uh, surgery and I came to, the nurse is like, hey, the doctor didn't prescribe you anything, and I'm like, yeah, I'm an addict. And he's like, wow. He's like, you just woke up. I was like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm an addict. Don't give me anything. <laughs> like, yeah. Like this feels good enough yeah. coming out of anesthesia. Like, yeah. I don't need anything. Yeah. No. So, yeah. I had um, I had surgery where it was a level of pain that that they were like, um, it's cute that you're an addict, but we are going to have to do something <laughs> and um, just to even do this, right? And so I was like, okay, well, what, what do you suggest? And but he was really like listening, and he ended up. Um, giving me a whole way of doing it where he gave me more in the surgery so I was just coming off of it and and I gave the pills to somebody to do it for me to monitor me that's good and then I came off I came I, I did the very least I could possibly do because I know I know myself and armed with knowledge about yourself is yes. like half of it right there so when um so when was it that you said you know what the pain pills are an issue now I need to stop what happened? Uh, the first time, 
So I got out of the Air Force, medically retired in 2008, and the VA at the time um, was just sending me my pain pills in the mail. I knew I had a problem kind of with pain pills when I was in the Air Force, like as I was getting out, because um, when I was running out of my Vicodin, I learned that the Air Force docs, like, hey, if I go back in and tell them this isn't working as well as it did, can we swap to something else? Even though I had already eaten my 30-day supply in 15 days. Oh, interesting. um, They would... They would go ahead and say, okay, stop taking the other ones, and here's a 30-day prescription of Percocet. That's a sign (laughs) of addiction. (laughs) Like, when you try to, like, figure your way around the system, that's a sign. (laughs) Manipulation of our environment to get what we want. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is that? Okay, and so um, that was all in 2008? 2008, yep. And up up from 2008 to 2010 when my son was born, um, I remember I was numb when he was born. Uh, I missed the birth of my first daughter, my first child. I was over in Iraq and mm-hmm. came home, got out uh, 2008, and then my son was born in 2010. But I'd been on Vicodin doing the same thing. It was my 30-day prescription would come from the VA in the mail. I called it my happy pill um, because I was. I was happy for about 20 days, and then I would crash <laughs> off for the last 10 of the mm-hmm. month. And here at the time, my wife was having to deal with this Mm. crap, you know, and Mm -hmm. our marriage was just failing. So Mm -hmm. I think she thought having another child was going to fix it. And of course, yeah, I'm sitting here and, you know, watching the birth of my child and I felt nothing. I was like, I know I'm supposed to feel connected to this. And I was like, I got to stop. So I went and self-admitted to the um, Air Force Hospital uh, up in Anchorage and was like, I have a problem. I need to be taken off of opioids completely. I said, I, I don't want them anymore. So then I went, mm-hmm. and at the time I was working in the oil field. Um, and so I went up there for a six week stretch and detoxed uh, pretty much and wasn't on them since until 2017. Mm-hmm. Um, what made you go back on them? Hurt my back here in Vegas. Um, and there was a nurse, well, actually, so what happened, my, my wife here, she got injured. I took her into the doctor and I had to carry her. So I threw my back out pretty bad. (sighs) And so the docs, the nurse and I was like, well, would you like something for your pain? And I'm like, Hmm, Mm, that's a funny question. (laughs) I haven't had anything in seven years. So I've been a good boy. Yeah, Yeah. sure. I'll probably be okay. Yeah. They give me 30 day supply. I was fine. I went back, um, and asked for a refill. (laughs) Sure. Here's a refill, and then they sent me off to. He was retiring, so they sent me to the pain management clinic, and from there it was just kind of the same thing. I was up and down off of them, and um, got in a car accident in 2018, mm. um, and so they kept feeding me Vicodin, and uh, realized I had a problem again in 2019. Um, when I knew I had a problem again already, but I wasn't admitting it to anybody, but I was flying back from work in Alaska and um, I'd already eaten all my pills for the month. So I went and made a false police report that somebody had stole my pills on the airplane right down here so I can go get another refill. Mm. Um, And that was not really an eye opener at the time, but um, I remember quitting Father's Day 2019, because I told my wife, I was like, okay, fine, I'm done with them. And she was like slowly kind of using Vicodin mm-hmm. as a, her, the Vicodin she had as kind of a control mechanism. Like she saw me in pain, so she was like, here, here's two, you know. And so I was just trying to like sometimes show her I was in pain, so she would give me two. Mm-hmm. But then I was saving them so that I could mm-hmm. take, you know, a bunch at one time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then um, I met someone who was able to get me Oxy. Actually, he was getting my Vicodin at first, and then, and then he got me Oxy. And after I took Oxy, Vicodin did nothing. Right. Absolutely nothing. Yeah. I was like, I'm never taking Vicodin again. Yeah. But he was getting me, you know, back and forth. Her and I had been split up for a while, my wife and I. Um, this is around the year to 2020. Um, and sold our house, getting divorced, all that fun stuff. Life spiraling out of control. Um, got arrested, um, spent some time in CCDC, mm-hmm. and um, realized I had a problem. Um, the withdrawals were getting so mm-hmm. horrible, and uh, just was in misery. I was like, my dad, my dad straight told me, he said, "Look, you got three options. He goes, you can go to jail, you can die, 
or you can get sober. And I was like, man, that sober one that was like so far from anything I could even think of. Yeah. Like that's not possible. Like yeah. the days when I was withdrawing, I remember driving around Vegas and I'd see families like walking in front of me at like TJ Maxx and they're mm -hmm. smiling and laughing. And I'm like, there's no way those people are happy. They're effing on something. They got to be on something if they're happy. You know, that was the way I saw the world. Or the delusional. It was. I used to tell people, I used to yeah. tell myself they were delusional. Yeah. It's like, oh, must be nice being so ignorant. <laughs> it's true. Like, that's how I saw the world. It's so sick. It is. <laughs> oh, my God. And I think back to that, too. Like, that was all I saw. Yeah. Everyone yeah. else is screwed up. Yeah. This whole oh. world is screwed up. God, the addiction mindset. Ugh. It's an, it's incredible, honestly. So like, how did you find out about the Warrior's Heart program? Um, I was in some IOP programs here in Vegas. Um, okay. Intensive and, outpatient. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I relapsed in one of them. And um, the counselor there was like, you know what? There's a place across town that you can go to that is kind of for more for military background. Uh, they do a lot of work with the active duty Um where is it located? It's uh, that one's desert. Um, that one's the uh, so the Seven Hills was where I was at, okay. and then she sent me over to um, Desert. Oh, what's it called? It's the one up there off of um, the five fifteen. That's okay. I can't remember okay. off the top of my yeah. head. Yeah, <laughs> um, Desert Parkway. There it is. Okay. Yeah. So you just the, have to let it go. My brain, it comes I know. Back. Yeah. Um, so I went through an intensive outpatient program there. But in between there, when I was, she was sending me over there, she said, you know, go there. And I was like, yeah, sure, I'll head there right now. She called her friend that worked there. Mm -hmm. What did I do? I went straight home because I was withdrawing at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm like, F that. And so she's calling my ex-wife at the time trying to find where I was at, and make sure I was okay. And mm -hmm. I'm not answering the phone. And I finally, my dealer called me. He's sitting there and he's like, he can get me some. And I'm like, sweet. So I went and got some from him. Lasted a couple days, got my last 30-day prescription of Vicodin, um, ate those in three days, went into, uh, was trying to find a, a clinic after I went through the ER clinic here, withdrawing. So this story is kind of long story short. Basically, I was calling around trying to find an inpatient program here in Vegas that took TRICARE. And the guy that was running it, I guess is the most plush clinic here, I don't remember the name of it, okay. inpatient. Um, he was like, you know what? He got back on the phone after he said, no, we don't take your insurance. But he said, there's this place in Texas that was made for you. And I was like, what do you mean made for me? He's <laughs> like, it's for military and first responders only. And I'm like, really? I said, okay. I don't know if I want to go there, though. Because <laughs> I had been so far removed from the right, military right. at that point. I was, and I was like, cops? No. Yeah. <laughs> I had just been Especially arrested. Especially after I was in jail. Yeah. You don't really love them when we're in jail. No. Yeah. I was... I was in a hate place uh, yeah. for sure. And um, I called them and I started talking to them and <clears throat> they did the in processing part of it mm -hmm. and explained kind of how everything worked there. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I got a bed date. Yeah, I got a bed date where they were like, okay, we can get you in this date. And so this was um, August 12th, 2020 was the day after I got out of the ER. Um, and was calling around trying to find that impatient stuff. And um, luckily my brother came down from Idaho to stay with me because I think I would have relapsed again yeah. after that waiting. Mm -hmm. But I went through the Desert um, Parkway uh, program mm -hmm. and went through that until I uh, left for Texas. Um, and it was kind of amazing too because I had had – and this is the summer. This was. In Texas. I know. I what was part kinda, of Texas? It was Bandera. It's northeast of, or northwest of San Antonio, about okay. an hour. Yeah, I uh, spent the seven years hills. in Texas. That's why. Yeah. Yeah, so you're right in the middle of mosquitoes and everything. Humidity. And yeah. Yeah, yeah yep. coming from here. I was yeah. like. Weesh. Yeah, it was not enticing. But at the same time, like I had gotten, I had I'd been accepted to go to, um, what's the uh, real plush one in Malibu? Um, it's the, I don't remember the commercials I used to see when I was a kid. It was 
Malibu something. I can't remember. So it was a plush one. Yeah. Like, but this was the one that spoke to you. It, it did this when I felt, left. Yeah. It did when I was leaving here. Like, I was, I didn't know where I was going, honestly. The day I was leaving. The getting, intuition. You know, when we, like, was. you know, I don't know why, but I think, I think this is it. I think this is the place I need to go. And I drove there. So Ooh. it was 1,200 miles of yeah, thinking about the this the whole yeah. way, you know. <laughs> and I'm just like... Out in the middle of nowhere, went through Roswell, New Mexico, never been there, seeing all the aliens. Like, my life was just weird at this point. I'm like, I'm driving <laughs> myself to rehab. <laughs> and I'm looking at all this stuff I'd never seen before. Mm. And it was just kind of... Surreal. Um, yeah, it really was. Okay, so what was the program like there? Um, when I got there, I almost left the first day I got there because they told me, you know, you have no for the first three days is blackout like you can't have your phone right. you can't be other computers none right. of that stuff that is very effective it is and i honestly think that they should keep it Longer. but i mean yeah. even even what they do after that though too is um pretty intense compared to most places is they you can only check your phone out for one hour out of yeah. the day yeah um but i think it should be less than yeah, that yeah i agree until they teach people how to function because, with it because a lot of times the people that they would contact are the people who are either in addiction or who are enabling them, them yep. right yep. or who they're having a lot of stress and pressure with because they're fighting with them yep. or they're dealers yep absolutely so you know it's 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 recommended when you get into recovery to change your people places and play things yep. right and so here you have them all on speed dial on your phone so like that is it's dangerous to have your phone when you're needing to keep your back and forth in your own mind about what you want to do and even if you want to get sober there's a part of you that's still talking to you you know so i think it's excellent it pisses people off yeah. to no end yep. and especially the people on the outside who can't get in touch with people and want to make sure they're okay but you're you're freaking out they're in a safe place but you're freaking out because you're codependent so we need to get you in another program you know yes so yeah you are preaching because I, yeah. I it's very true like the nobody in there understood their own codependency towards everything oh, yeah, else absolutely but then yeah they're their loved ones that are out there on so the did outside. you have a room to yourself or did you have well initially so what what happens there too towards the end of the program real quick jump ahead is you have the um by week three or four you can sign up for extra weeks you okay. can stay longer than the 42 days um and this is all extension. insurance covered or yep, mostly okay. i mean some people pay though to go. some people pay yeah. um to keep it anonymous for themselves but at the same time yeah. some people don't have insurance so have too if they don't have veterans like if they don't have the v the va covers it 100 percent. wow 100 percent. the va covers it yep, absolutely 100%. really 100 percent um that's amazing it is and they and they do all the paperwork there they actually have a team there that sits down and does and what's really cool is they'll actually assist you through filing for your disabilities with the va too oh, like that's, if that's these amazing. veterans come there and they've never filed before they actually have people there that'll help you take all of oh your God, medical records and everything yeah and they file wow and you get 100 percent paid disability from the va while you're in the clinic wow so it's that's, it makes sense why you would stay right up to 10 weeks wow yeah that's phenomenal yep i wonder if they have anything for like the police and all that that they I have some sort of program going where they can you know sponsor them into re recovery like that they should they should um, who knows if they do maybe warrior the warrior heart program would know they that. do have a program there that helps people get there too like they they'll pay i think it, there's like two different um foundations that actually um fund like getting veterans police and first responders there uh, from anywhere, in the, like they'll pay the plane tickets and they'll pay a percentage of their actual uh, treatment too. I could see um, people who are um, maybe in certain types of uh, positions where their job, they don't want it on the record that they have an addiction, but they have a problem and certain people might know that they have a problem. So they take sick, sick leave and they don't go through the normal channel so it's not on their record, but they go to a place like this that deals specifically with that and because it's so anonymous and everybody's like everybody's information is protected yeah, I mean, even at the level of yeah. the 12-step program that this that they do too right absolutely yeah so like when i first drove up i drive through the gate like it's on this 540 acre ranch mm -hmm. um it was an old conoco phillips like executive retreat mm -hmm. so like all these buildings all over this property that were originally there were they had bars in all of them mm -hmm. like so we're, we're going through treatment and there's like this bar and all these other amenities that um 
<laughs> you wouldn't expect to have in a rehab clinic, but right. it was it was phenomenal. Like there's these little cottages and cabins and these different places, and and you share. Um, most people share a room. There's two beds, um, like full size beds in each room, um, and they're like log cabin looking places too. That's like, nice. Yeah, it's very cozy. Like yeah, that's this, good for getting your zen. Oh, very, you're, very. When you much. first get there, you're anything but. Well, you did your whole travel through. I did. You know, so you you kind of were pre zen in. I did. Yeah. <laughs> I actually get a lot of um, um, mental relief when I go on road trips. I do. I get a lot of thinking done, and I get yeah. a lot of reflection in yeah. life, and that it was a really good one. slows life down. Yeah, it yeah, does. That's absolutely. one that I'll never forget is that drive down there. So do they um, – so I know, like, they – so there's the there's a 12-step program for warriors. Is it from there, or – it's Yeah, it is. It's specifically, like um, – so the whole program there at Warriors Heart uh, is based around – the 12 step AA. Um, okay. So is it Warriors in Recovery or Warriors Anonymous? Warriors Anonymous. Warriors, and that comes from them? It does. That's phenomenal. Yeah. So now they're, they're, they're using. They're sprouting up all over the country. This is great. And and so, like, but I mean, people can attend the Warriors Anonymous, then just, just attend that. They don't even need to go to the Warriors Heart unless they need to go to the Warriors Heart, but yeah. they can go to a Warriors Anonymous meeting on Zoom, right? Absolutely. Um, so the first year I was out of there, I went to one every single day. There's one. Monday through Friday, and nice. it's the same time, and it's login and all that stuff is the same. And there were people that were popping up from different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. um, like, I remember this guy from Texas. There was a guy, there was a police officer from Phoenix that found out about it, and he'd just log on, and he would, you know, you kind of learn the etiquette, too, in the room, like how it, how it functions, like how in, in an AA meeting, it's kind of like How do they understand. stop people who are not, like, qualified how do they stop people who are not first responders or veterans from being in a Zoom meeting? Like, how do they, how do uh, they keep that on the hush? Um, I think they've had a few people come in and they block them. They'll block them and mute them and whatever, and then kick them from the meeting. How do like, they call, how do they know? Does somebody have to show a badge or? I, they have to be uh, vetted by somebody else, basically. Okay. Like, so I can give the. Um, so the somebody can somebody from the outside can contact Warriors yes. Anonymous. And Warriors Anonymous can talk to them and then see and then give them the information to go to the meeting. Yep. And then when they go in, and if they give that information away to somebody or okay. somebody gets a hold of it that isn't. I think um, of these things. I do too. I wondered that. I, I think of these things I... because I'm protective over people, but because I was a person who didn't follow rules before. And so I think. How of, would I get in? Kind of. Yeah. How would, people I mean, are going to. I yeah. think I think of like whenever I walk into a place and I go like I, I'll be able to see where maybe this the place's security could possibly have a breach and because I have like a partly hopefully never to be used again criminal mind <laughs> who thinks outside <laughs> of the box in a very pretty way to say that um, but like also it's helped me to to be able to protect. And to do things the right way, knowing like, oh well, I know that there are people that would think this way, so let's let's put an extra lock on that door. It's like the best yeah. home security people are the burglars. Yes. Yeah. Yes. For Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, so okay, so um, so you, but you don't just go to Warriors Anonymous; you go to Alcoholics Anonymous too. I do. Okay. Um, when I was in Warriors Heart, I, it was week three. Uh, we have all the meetings and stuff that we do in there and different sessions, group sessions and therapy and all that. Because that's what's beautiful about Warrior's Heart was that it was um, treatment for PTSD. You have a trauma mm -hmm. therapist mm -hmm. and you also have a substance abuse therapist mm -hmm. that you see during the week. And so when I was there, I discovered, oh, I'm an alcoholic too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, most people don't understand. They think that... Um, drug addiction is just if you're like addiction is just if you're on like it's a drug or, or a behavior and that alcohol is it's just by itself but when we realize that it's all mind-altering substances yep. and there are certain things that we are more likely to use based on our own inner chemistry and what we're trying to obtain yep. you know like I never did cocaine I never did cocaine. Me either. Because I can't handle going up, up, up. I was already fight or flight. I needed to be numb and not here. I think and that's so everything why I, never I did, did it. was like, just check me out. Everything was alcohol, pain pills, pot, you know, like just, just check me out. You know, even cigarettes gave me that break. Yep. Like, just, just get me out of here. I just want a break. You know, I never wanted to be, phew, you know, I never needed that. 
No, I was the same way. Honestly, like I, I makes sense now. I wondered why I never touched it. I always never touched it because I was afraid of. I was afraid who of going, I was going to be. Yeah, I, I had anger issues. Yeah, I had PTSD. Yep. I was like, I can imagine myself becoming the Hulk. Yep. Like, we don't need to add cocaine. I already had to problems with alcohol. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Emotionally, like, yeah. what would happen if I put that in there? Yeah. Yeah. Same I mean, with meth and all the other ones. But if you think like, about it, that's all we're really doing is self-medicating. Yeah. And so we get we get kind of, like, attracted to certain things seeming to have a certain effect. Some people just take whatever, anywhere, just to party. And, but, but to get really addicted to something is because there's a part of you that's going, you know what? Where were you my whole life? This I need you. I need you. You and me. We're gonna take on the world. Whatever it is, you click on the thing because there is, there's something. And your DOC, yeah, your when, drug of choice. Drug of choice. And but you have a drug of choice for a reason. Opioids. That was mine. But it's all addiction, yep. right? And so it's, it's all nurturing the same. something. It's yeah. that's all it's really doing is it's nurturing a part of you. Yeah. Um, that you need to you think that connects with it yeah yeah you, you think, think it's it's self-love you yeah. think it's self-love you convince yourself it convinces you it you does. love yourself <laughs> you need a break you need a drink you need a pill you just need a break just take your break but the problem is that um if we if we don't develop the tools to deal with a situation in that moment what we're really doing by avoiding the situation and avoiding dealing with it by taking a substance or drinking is we're weakening ourselves so that the next time we have to deal with that situation, we're not going to be able to. So when we, that's, there's nothing that taking a drink or a pill can't make worse because it's, you're not building the psychic muscle to be able to be an empowered person in this world. We get it. We, that's why we get weaker. This is not just because you're getting an effect from the alcohol and drugs that's part of the addiction. It's because there's while we're becoming, while we're starting to rely on something, we're starting to rely less on tools, support, processing things, healthier ways of being. So there's a there's a thing that's happening at the same time where it's become like a, a stand-in for us being able to be empowered. And they say that when you first start using alcohol or drugs, like you stop really truly developing a lot of these things. And so it's why we go and we get tools in recovery and we go, kidding, starting over now, let me learn the things I need to learn and let me help other people to learn it as well. And so- I couldn't have said that better. That's really I, wonderful. I, I, I'm, I'm blown away that the VA pays for this because um, how many people who are in and out of addiction because of, um, you know, PTSD or injuries um, from being in the military or even like whatever, like, you know, <laughs> like, geez, you know, like to be able to go through this kind of a program, um, of course, you have to be ready to do this kind of a program. You have to be willing to like go to Texas and, oh, and, do, and be there. I'm sure they vet to some degree and say are you like are you willing to do this before they just give you a bed right like, oh completely to yeah to make sure that you're serious yep. because they're not they're not just gonna like they have don't, i mean there's only 62 people in the program at a given moment right, right and they're not there to just no. feed somebody and house them if they're not serious about wanting to heal no. but when a person is serious about wanting to heal whoever came up with this amazing program like i could feel how divinely inspired it is you know oh, and it I, just, is. I just i love that i just that's amazing. So it was awesome. Yeah, I mean, I you said it earlier. Um, you know, you stopped developing, and yeah. so I, I truly feel like when I left there, that was like I was reborn in that That's moment, amazing. and I started growing up. Yeah, I got the chills. That's yeah. awesome. Well, we're we're reaching the end of our hour, um, and the, what a great conversation this has been. How it flew. flew. Yeah. <laughs> I looked down. I was like, really? Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. Cow. Um. So if you know anybody who um, is a first responder um, or somebody who's been in the military um, or anything and you think that they might have a problem but they don't know where to go, this might be something to look into. I think it's the warriorsheart.org, I yes. think it is. We just Google the Warriors Heart Program um, and Warriors Anonymous. You'll be able to start making connection, contact them and find out more information about it and, um, and get help or get help for somebody that you know and love. Um, I think that our egos 
are our biggest issues when it comes to stopping using substances uh, and getting help. And when we're in a job, even like uh, like first responders, that I can imagine how hard even more so it is to say, I need help, you know, and to know that there's a place that really gets what's really needed as if you're going to get help, get help. So, yeah. So thank you for coming on the no, show. No, thank you for having me. It was awesome. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for joining us today on The Real Recovery Show. We'd like to give a special thanks to our sponsor and gracious host, PHLV Radio, here in Las Vegas. And uh, please remember also that the opinions expressed here are strictly those of the people who gave them. They don't represent any 12-step program, even though we've talked about one, or should replace your own intuition or professional medical advice. And um, you can watch us on Facebook, YouTube, and on Amazon Fire TV. You can listen to us on the PHLB radio app or get our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or iHeartRadio. And um, every week we post this on Facebook, but we also have all of our episodes on TheMediaSpace.com. So if you want, please pass these uh, shows on to other people to get the word out. And if you're thinking about being on an upcoming episode, fill out an intake form or fill out our contact form on TheMediaSpace.com. So thanks again and see you next week.